Hi, I'm Stacy. And I am Mark, and this is the Gurus and Game Changers podcast. Welcome, everybody. Well, compared to today's guest and Marlon, I have to admit, I live a pretty boring life. Marlon ran away with the circus at the age of 18 to become an elephant keeper. He was uh, making a living as a juggler at 19. He was on national television by 20. And ultimately, he rose to become a very prominent and acclaimed Las Vegas performer and comedy club headliner. And then while all of us would say, wow, what a great start, embrace that, cherish it, build on it, he gave it all up. For what? Wait for it. <laughs> to go live in a treehouse in the jungle with no electricity yeah, for sure he did. five yeah. Yeah. years. That's crazy. Talk about like the road less traveled. The, this man um, exemplifies that. Fast forward, he's a humorist. He's a world traveler. He's an inventor. He's a philosopher. He's a speaker. He has lived the 100,000 foot perspective of life and how to make the most of it and make every day count. He's going to share all of that with us, recognizing what uh, matters most. Oh, and by the way, he is a globally recognized expert on astrotourism, dark sky, and light pollution. I know there's a lot to unpack here. I don't know where this conversation is going to take us, but I know it's going to be a good ride. Marlon, welcome to the show, Thank buddy. Thank you, Marlon. We are so thrilled Thank to have you, you here. Oh, this is fun. What a great <laughs> intro. I want to meet this guy. <laughs> oh, please, come on in. As We're soon, happy as, to meet as, soon you. as you're not in Vietnam anymore, come on and stop by. Let me, let me take you back. I want to go back. To the circus. Sure. I'm going to start at the beginning because yeah, yeah, yeah. you've, you've lived this wild ride of a life. So we, we've all heard about people, you know, they're going to run away with the circus. You actually did it. Um, and it's yeah. a very courageous thing to do, right? Where did that courage come from at 18? Um, you know, it was part courage and it was part fear. This was 1974. Uh, I was doing uh, street parties, uh, uh, street parties and children's parties and juggling and I got a job at, at a cheese store to pay the rent right <laughs> and because the juggling was still a side hustle and the owner saw me juggling he goes hey why don't you go stand out in front and get try to people in so I'm out there juggling salamis and cheese balls and these two <laughs> clowns walk up and they're like real clowns and I say what are you two clowns doing in the mall and I realized when it came out of my mouth like wait a minute that's usually safe for people who were like you know right. jerk no, Not these real are real clowns. They, so they're seeing me and they go, hey, you're pretty good at that. Have you ever done any clowning? I said, do children's parties count? They go, yeah. They go, would you like a job in the circus? Like, <laughs> Just like that. Who is going to say no to that? Right. The irony is, is that I had to avoid the draft because there was still the draft going on and mm -hmm. sending people to Vietnam. Mm. I had taken the test and I was going to be an air traffic controller the recruitment center was right next to the cheese store. All I had to do was go in and raise my hand and say, I do. And that was going to happen the next day. Wow. Wow. And these people offered me a job as a clown in the circus. And I went, yeah, baby. I mean, that's like, that's the golden ticket. Yeah. So what happened, how I ended up with the elephants <laughs> is I get hired as a clown and I get fired after the third day. Aww. Now, when you get fired as a clown... There's an existential <laughs> crisis. <laughs> Wait, there's a story there about how did you get how fired? Did you, yeah, how did you get fired? <laughs> yeah, I know. How did you get fired as a clown? Okay. So in the circus, there's a thing called the production gag. And when the, the trapeze is being set up or the wild cage, animal cage is being taken down, they need to pull focus. Right. So they send out a bunch of clowns to do a sketch, right? It's called a production, a production gag. So I'm in the production gag. And all I had to do was blow a whistle. That was it. And I went, <laughs> you mean I gave up my flat and came all the way here and all I'm doing is blowing a whistle? Who aspires to blow a whistle? I mean, maybe a lifeguard or a referee, right? So I said, can I please do something else? He said, okay, you can do some carpet clowning. And carpet clowning is up in the stands when the tent is being filled up before the show starts, yeah. you're doing close-up clowning, right? You're <laughs> clowning for this person, <laughs> this row. And I and I nailed it. I nailed it. Now there was one other old clown on this on the on the show. Porky the comic cop. Porky was 79 years old and was an original Mac Senate Keystone cop. This oh guy God. was still alive, right? And I was upstaging him. Oh. And he was from the other side of the tent. 
So the, my boss comes to me on the second day and goes, you can't do the carpet clowning anymore. It's just for Abe, Abe Goldfarb. You can't do it anymore. I was crestfallen. So I went wow. outside the tent. I'm not even in the tent. <laughs> I'm outside the tent, making balloon animals, doing some close-up clowning. And I hear this guy go, hey, you, kid. Like, what? I can't hear it over the squeaking, you know, over the squeaking <laughs> balloon. Kid, you. And I turn around and he is snarling, mask of fury. Get out of here. What do you think you're doing? And I ran away. And that upset him. And he told the owner and the older told her my boss. And my boss said, I'm sorry, kid. I got to let you go. Oh wow. God, circus because politics. Because you were good at what you did. Circus politics. <laughs> circus yeah. clown oh, politics. Clown hey, politics. I know. It's circus <laughs> politics. So on, oh, it's not just circus. It's showbiz politics. Yeah. I learned lesson yeah. many times going through my career that mm. if you shine too bright, people don't want to share the mm. stage with you. It's crazy. That's they will, they'll, they'll They'll slap you down. So anyways, I'm on the lot the next day to collect $10 that I loaned to the elephant guy there, the guy who's the not the trainer. There's a groom. He's, he's called a bull man because okay. in the circus, elephants are called bulls. Uh -huh. And uh, I came back to collect the 10 bucks. And while I'm there, this old, grizzled, gnarly gnome of a man comes up to me and goes, hey, kid, I think I know you. <laughs> And I go, I have never seen you before in my life. No, I think I know you. <laughs> no, like? I don't think so. He goes, you need a job? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I do. <laughs> Just get fired as a clown. Have you care of elephants? Uh, no. <laughs> have you been around any livestock? <laughs> well, yeah, cows and horses. Oh, you'll be fine. And he gives me this phone number. And I call the guy up and I go out. His name is Bucky Steele. He takes me out back, opens his barn. He's got five elephants in there. Wow. And offers me the job as Just the groom. Like that. Just how, like that. How, how and, long were you with the circus? I, I was I, in that job, in that yeah. particular position for 14 months. Oh. And, and so for the first month, uh, when I'm mucking, right, shoveling and yeah. doing all this, stuff, he says, work. I'll be with you every morning and every evening when you do this. And I go, don't you think I can do it? I mean, I'm just shoveling manure. He goes, oh, I don't have any problem thinking you'll do it. I just want to make sure the elephants don't kill you. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Are they scary? Were they scary? Well, this is the thing. Elephants have killed more people <gasps> than all of the other acts combined times two. Seriously. In the circus. Seriously. And most of them are drifters and people you never hear about. Wow. No fancy. I was 18. I'm doing the job of guys who are like in their 50s and 60s. A lot of them just dead enders, nowhere to go, but this job. And uh, there were times when my life was very much on the line. And I saved one guy's life from being killed. And there was one time when I almost got killed myself. I mean, it was that far from being killed by one of my own charges from startling her. And sure enough, when I was doing research for my book, a, a bull man died in that very arena, wow. startling one of his elephants. They get scared. They trample you. They can kill you just with their trunk knocking you or kicking you. Or I mean, they're so powerful. And they can do it without even trying to. They seem so docile, but well, I'll take your word for it. Yes, they <laughs> are docile until they're not. Whatever you do, don't back down. <laughs> they probably smell your, they'll smell your fear. It's pretty tough. Yeah, they'll smell your fear. They're going to challenge like you, but <laughs> do not back down. And sure enough, the little male that he had, he challenged me. And, and there was that moment of truth. What am I going to do? He lowered his head. He backed up. He was ready to, you know, either hit me or butt me. So I punched him in the eye. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you're supposed to do Show with a shark, his boss, right? too. Like if a shark comes out, you're supposed to punch him in the eye. Yeah. Really? I didn't know yeah. that. Okay. Yeah, that's a, that's a that. thing. Next yeah, go for the <laughs> eyes. Next time you're with Always sharks. go for the eyes. Wow. Well, so that's what you're doing in Vietnam, right? You're, you're uh, actually researching and talking about or thinking about your elephant history because you're writing a well, memoir. Well, no, I, wrote, I, came, I came here to Vietnam in tw uh, October 22 to okay. write my memoir uh, of this time as an elephant keeper. There is not a book I've looked. There isn't a book that's ever been written as a firsthand account nonfiction uh, of an uh, an elephant uh, keeper, a bull man in the circus. Hmm. The, the title of the book is 
the toll paid on the road less traveled. Oh, that's Ooh. funny. I said the road less traveled in the intro. That's hilarious. Oh, I love that. <laughs> so, so yeah. yeah. So speaking of Vietnam, I saw the video that you posted up about the birds in the cage. Then you you set one free. Oh yes, that, that video that you set one free. That to me, I, I feel like it was sort of symbolic. Like you seem like such a free spirit. Like I, I watched so many of your interviews, and you know, in addition to being like you know a brilliant philosopher on astrotourism, like you're also a free spirit. So my, my question to you is like, what advice would you give to people, you know, whether they're scholars or not, like enlightening up and just having fun with what they do? Well, uh, the single best piece of advice I give is never take a single piece of advice. <laughs> That's the best. <laughs> Actually, what was it? Benjamin Franklin said advice is often given and seldom taken. Right. Mm. But um, if if uh, I'm starting a... a, a a, um, an, inst not an institute or whatever, a conservatory, a conservatory of creativity, teaching people how to use their imagination, how to amplify and strengthen their creativity through inspired play. So Love this. something that adults forget. Now, there's a difference between play and competing. Yeah, you'll go out and play golf, mm -hmm. you'll play tennis, but the aim is to win. Right. Play, there is no winner because there's, you're not competing, right? So like blowing bubbles or playing with blocks or, uh, you know, playing any kind of um, um, something that, that where there isn't an outcome that needs to be met for you to enjoy yourself, right? As they say, it's not whether you win or lose, it's how you play. Uh. Yeah. Play, play for play's sake. Einstein said that play is the highest form of research. Right. Yeah. Who's going to argue with him? <laughs> <laughs> I've heard of him. Yeah. I watched one of your TED Talks. Um, so, so good. You spent like the first five minutes of the TED Talk in darkness. Good afternoon. I want you to see light differently. And then you juggled iridescent balls and helped the audience understand the dangers of light pollution. So where are we now globally, in your mind, in our efforts to preserve the dark sky? And for anyone who doesn't, doesn't know what dark sky is, maybe fill us in on that too. Okay, so uh, thank you for the question. 80% uh, of North Americans uh, cannot see the Milky Way. 60% of Europeans cannot see the Milky Way. 99% of the world's population is impacted by some form of light pollution. Night after night, the stars shine down on us as we looked up at them until the invention of electricity. In 1882, the Pearl Street Generating Station came online in New York City. Now, uh, Edison uh, brought forth the, uh, the um, release of this illuminated bulb uh, back at the end of the uh, 19th century. And the first year, there was 400. In the second year, there were 10,000. And that number has never decreased since then. Um, so what has happened is we have basically set our nights on fire with electricity. And it is literally uh, impossible for people to be able to go out and see the night sky unless they travel a long ways to get out from under this dome of light that we're all living under. People like to go to dark sky places. And the biggest question that people have goes, well, if you turn off the lights, uh, isn't that gonna increase crime, right? right. Number one, there's no studies that show that that's the yeah. case. But I always say, well, if light prevented crime, then there wouldn't be any crime during the day, yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Makes sense. You've done so many things and you are playful and you are fun. But then astro tourism just seems very like a very serious thing, right? I mean, maybe not. Yeah. Maybe like looking at the stars and you've written a book on astro tourism. Um, what is it and what's the difference between astro tourism and space tourism? I got that one. Yes. <laughs> I would think space you would. tourism <laughs> is you go to a place, space tourism is you go to a place to look down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Astro tourism is <laughs> not a place to look up. Yeah, that's hilarious. Very simple okay. but uh, accurate description, right? 
Yeah, space tourism is uh, reserved for a very uh, elite few who have the money. Astroturs is available to anybody who can escape the dome of light that they're living under. And, and the astrotourism, how I became an expert in this field, all came from me playing in the dark with light. Hmm. See? Right? <laughs> she loves to be in the dark. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I, I tell people, uh, as children, we're afraid of the dark. But when we become yeah. an adult, we realize some of the best times we ever have in our lives are when the lights are out. <laughs> <laughs> I've always wanted to see the northern lights. So that's something that I feel like could be astrotourism. So <laughs> you're raising your hand. So am I, where's the best place to see the Northern Lights? In the North. <laughs> as North as you can get. Marlin. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Okay, look, it's, you know, there, it, okay, number one, the Northern Lights are happening all the time, right? But you can only see them in the wintertime because you need to have darkness. And you have to go, there's a thing called the auroral zone which is like this band up towards the up towards the North Pole, not exactly the North Pole, but right around it. And I don't remember what the degrees and latitudes are, but you know, uh, Alaska, uh, Greenland, Iceland, Finland, the upper parts of Finland and uh, Sweden, Norway. And uh, those are the best places to see it. However, they are not always consistent. You can get an app. <laughs> that lets you know when there's a solar flare that's happening. There's an app for and that. And they've got something like, I don't know, 17 minutes or whatever it is, or however long it takes, eight minutes before it actually hits, you know, the magno the magnosphere around our, uh, our planet and creates that. So there's a little bit of a warning sign. But it's, you're going to have to go during the winter. And uh, there are places, I mentioned in my book, where they've got these glass igloos where you can get nice and cozy and warm. And that's what I want to do. Yeah, nice. so fun. Play. Yeah. But... I must say that the the grand stellar, the the Taylor Swift of <laughs> um, celestial events is a total solar eclipse, and right. there's another one happening in America, April eighth. Now, get this: after war and famine, more people are migratory uh, are temporarily displaced uh, by a total eclipse. So the only thing that moves more people than a total eclipse for temporary migration is war and famine. How, how, how so? People traveling to see it? Yes, people okay. traveling to see it. Got millions, it. millions of people will travel to get into the line of totality. Got it. Right? Sure. The last one that happened in 2017 18 times more people watch that than the final episode of Game of Thrones. Wow. <laughs> Just simply Google Great American Eclipse yeah. 2024 and you'll see the path and where you need to go. Most of the people who live in these cities where the, the totality is going to happen, right, live under this dome of light, have never seen the Milky Way, have never seen a sky full of stars. This is an opportunity for that to happen Right. If and only if the municipalities flip the switch right. to keep lights from coming on when everything goes dark. Right. Wow. Otherwise, all of the street lights will come on and it'll look just like it does any other night, any other night except yeah. you'll see the, the moon and the corona. We have to talk about you living in a jungle tree house with no electricity for five years okay. of your life. First off, how did you get to that point? And then secondly, what was it like? What did it teach you about yourself? Okay, so uh, the the brass ring was taken out of my hands three different times. Mm. In 1978, in 77, I did my first national television, uh, Don Kirshner's Rock concert, for those of you who are old enough to remember it. And uh, everybody was like, oh my God, this, this you know, I, I, I hit. I, I, you know, Don Kirshner said I was going to do for juggling what Doug Henning did for magic. <laughs> and, um, and, um, and then in 78, I, in 78, I toured with Doug Henning. And then I was slated to do The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. He was a star maker. He was. I got bumped. I got bumped. <sighs> Someone the night before went overtime oh. and took that guy's spot. And the guy took my place. And the guy who took my place, you're not going to believe this, was a cow chip thrower from Beaver, Oklahoma. Oh, my God. Cow poop? Yep. He <laughs> threw cow poop. He did not. He yeah. didn't get his. He didn't get his star made. I'm sure. No. And so, and I tried to get on 
for the next 10 years, tried to get on, but a new oh uh, director came in and he never gave me my shot. So that was one. The second one, I did a series of 10 Toyota commercials that I produced and starred in. And it won Addy Awards, best hmm. regional campaign, best of show. And it almost went national, almost. <laughs> and there was a, you know, fallout <laughs> between the regional campaign, uh, you know, ad agency and the national campaign ad agency. So never the twain shall meet. Right. And then the third time I was to be the host of a late night comedy show called Off the Wall. And we're rehearsing this thing for like a month. And the day of the taping, this guy comes in with an agent that nobody had seen on the set, who does the opening spot, takes my place, <gasps> and his name was Kevin Pollock. Oh, wow. Went on to star with Robert De Niro, sure. and Tom Cruise, Tom Cruise and Demi Moore, Walter yeah. Matthau, and Jack Lemmon. And at that point, I was sitting in my house, looking up at the ceiling. I guess that whoever's up in the ceiling going, I get it. I'm not supposed to be doing this. Oh, well. So um, I got an invite to come and join a bunch of jugglers who was buy buying some land in Hawaii. And I went out there and it was all about self-sustainability. I'd been growing food and I wanted to learn more about it. And I threw in, I sold everything, moved out there and uh, had this experience. And uh, to sum it up, it was Gilligan's Island meets Lord of the Flies. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds uh, scary, <laughs> the Lord of the Flies it was. part. <laughs> it was. What, what did your day look like living in a treehouse? Um, first thing you wake up and you, you swat mosquitoes. Okay. And then, and then later on, you, you chase away the flies that are feeding off the dead mosquitoes that are on your body. Ew. <laughs> Realize like a dream. <laughs> that so, that was the Lord uh, of the Flies part, right? Or was yeah, yeah. Right. Well, yeah. Uh, clearing jungle, you wow. know, pulling out the uh, uh, the invasive species of the guavas to rescue the ohias, which are the endemic trees. Building my place, growing food. Uh, we would go out and you know uh, in the nights and walk, you know, for a couple of hours to see the lava flowing. Um, and oh, uh, so cool. you know, what the day was like, you know, it was a lot of hard work. I mean, breaking jungle is tough, right? That's what they call it. Breaking jungle. Well, I mean, you're basically having to, you know, cut it back so that you have a space to live. What happened after the treehouse? <laughs> like what? So you were there for how long? And then what, where'd you for go? Six years. And then they threw me out. No, what are you I, talking about? <laughs> yeah, I got, I was a founding Treehouse member politics. Thrown out <laughs> because Cloud I politics, a, yeah. treehouse politics. I was a maverick amongst misfits. <laughs> Basically. You outshone him again, it, right? Well, what, what happened was, uh, was uh, it became very cliquish. And I was advocating for a communication template or a model that would level the playing field. Well, it wasn't until later in life that I learned that the power base they don't want a level playing field mm. and, and they will marginalize and push anybody off the board who's advocating for a, a level playing field. And so I got pushed out. They tore down my house and uh, it was rad. It was a two story, 900 square foot tree house that made yeah. it into the Lonely Planet Guide to Hawaii. And uh, but I have a memory of it. So, I mean, you know, I've got that. And, uh, <laughs> and then I went and. Uh, bought some other land and started all over. Oh my goodness. In yeah. Hawaii on the big Island. Yeah. 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 About a mile away from where that was. Yeah. yeah. That's wild. So you, you, you have, I've heard you say in some, at some point in one of your speeches or somewhere that you prefer to be off your rocker than in, then in right. Yeah. Right. And uh, you call yourself a philosopher instead of a philosopher, philosopher. What, tell us about that mindset. Philosophy is making people laugh and think at the same time. Because if you just give them something to think about, it th there's usually this wall that's up, but if you can make them laugh, yeah. if you can tickle them into enlightenment, yeah. then they let down their guard and they're a little more trusting, right? So that's why I say, look, take everything with a grain of gestalt. Don't, uh, <laughs> and, and, and that's instead, you know, people have got to want to you know, when when this when the when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. Yeah. Right. You know, and so um, my particular brand of 
approaching life isn't for everybody, you know, but I, I, I honestly believe that, you know, enlightenment comes from being lighthearted, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and the, the Dalai Lama, he's always laughing, right? right? He's always laughing. So that's what they call him, the Jolly Lama. <laughs> so it's, it's one of the reasons why I say, you know, one of the fastest way through your karma is humor. When you can find what's funny about what's happened, then it no longer has control over you. And, and this is, this is the work. This is the, you know, being able to reframe the circumstance. For instance, we all know Sisyphus, curse to push the rock up the hill, right? Curse to push the rock. Well, how can we reframe that so that it wasn't a curse? Well, simple. He liked watching the rock roll down the hill so much, he couldn't wait to push it back and step to the top again. <laughs> <laughs> That's definitely a reframing. <laughs> I love it. So wait, how, how did you come to be? Like, what, what is your family like? Are your parents <laughs> philosophers too? Were they to serious? Be. Like, do you have brothers and sisters? Like, how how, how were you formed? <laughs> well, I was formed pretty much like all other human beings were formed. No, <laughs> uh, honestly, wow. uh, I came from a highly dysfunctional and toxic environment. Wow. Mm. Were you the youngest? Yeah. Usually the youngest yeah. is the funniest. Yeah, um, I'm much younger than all of my other siblings. I was the I was the fourth child that my father did not want, mm. and um, um, there was part of the reason that I wrote the book, The Contemplative Navel, was to find a way through to make sense of all of what happened. So, in a lot of spiritual literature. They say you have to learn to love your family before you can go out and love the world, right? Mm -hmm. That's where it's, it's, well, that was a tough one for me hmm. because it was, it was abusive, both physically and emotionally. And um, uh, my father left my mother after 25 years of marriage. My other siblings were already out of the house. I was left alone with this very embittered woman who did not want a precocious teenage son she was trying to find a husband so you know she found another husband i bonded with him she divorced him married another guy he threw me out of the house when i was 17 and still in high school because he was he wanted mommy 2.0 and um so learning it, it caused me to read a lot of works john bradshaw on the family for instance Coming from a multiple broken home, the the curse was, well, I didn't have really much of a pleasant childhood. The blessing is I also wasn't programmed right. and didn't have to take on all of the messages and all of the value sets that parents usually give their kids. Uh, and then they, you know, spend a lifetime trying to shake it off. Yeah. Was well, who was a positive influence on you? Who was your who if you had to name a guru that sort of put their arm, their arm around your shoulder and kind of led you the, down the right path? Well, when I was uh, 19, there was a gentleman by the name of Bill Palmer. He was a magician. He's a few years, maybe 10 years older than me. He's still alive. And he gave me a job at New Vaudeville Pizza Parlor, like a steady job. I wasn't just hustling on the streets. And that gave me the opportunity to really hone my craft and develop a lot of material because I had to do three 15-minute sets. Hmm. Jugglers usually do a six to eight minute set and that's it. That's all they do. So now I'm having to develop all of this new content. Right. So that was a huge, a huge benefit uh, back when I was 19 years old. Um, you know, reading, reading the books of people like uh, Buck's Min Buck, Buck Minister Fuller, hmm. you know, Bucky he was yeah. definitely life changing <laughs> because he lived his life as an experiment. And was I think living in a chicken coop or something like that? I mean, it's <laughs> living a really, in a chicken coop. He was a thinker yeah, I mean, for he, sure. He redesigned, he redesigned it, but he basically took a, a chicken coop and you know outfitted it so it'd be livable. That's what I remember in his in his book Critical Path. Um, um, it, it's it's funny when when you are when you're a maverick, when you're out cutting your own path and being the pioneer. There's not a lot of people who can mentor you hmm. because hmm. you're, you know, the pioneers, they were the ones who took, they're the ones who took the arrows, who right. died of starvation, right. who got 
lost in the wilderness. <laughs> it was the ones who followed who were the settlers. Right. Because they settled. Pioneers have to keep going. So, you know, I took my inspiration from all kinds of, from different artists, from music. When I went to go to create Luma, which toured for 21 years, which led me into the dark sky um, movement, I made it a point not to go see anybody else's shows. I didn't go see Blue Man. I didn't go see Cirque du Soleil. I went, I do not want their ideas in my head. So I would go to a planetarium or an aquarium or a gallery or a museum or anything other than that. And let that inspire me. Let that be my teacher. Yeah. Good. Let, me, let me ask you something. What, what experience, now, based on your experience, what, finish the sentence, the best piece of advice that Marlon can give, that I can give uh, to somebody just starting out in their life and starting out in adulthood. What is the best piece of advice you could give to somebody? Um, yeah, well, I mean, I think I answered that before. Never, never take a single piece of advice. I would say, I, I would say this: when you die, people do not remember you for how much money was in your bank account, but by how many people you served and how many lives you changed for the better. Don't wait to do your dream. Don't wait. Take the chance, take the risk. Um, and, and a lot of people say, well, that's easy for you to say because you don't have a mortgage. Okay, get out from under the mortgage. Hmm. If the mortgage is keeping you from living your dream, do your dream. Don't you wanna live a life that at the end of it, you can look back and say, yeah, I went for it. As, as opposed to saying, I wish I had. I wish I had, yeah. Don't live a life that say, I wish I had. Mm. That's good advice. I love that. So wait, so how can we help you get whatever word you're trying to get out there, out there, and what's next for you? Well, okay, so thank you very much for asking. I appreciate that. I am, uh, uh, I am um, about to launch the Conservatory of Creativity. And it's a four, four module a course with three lessons in each module and it teach it brings people into my world the mind of marlin <laughs> and teaches them different ways through inspired play to expand their creativity to sharpen their imagination to improve their interpersonal communications to be a better father to your kid or a better mother to your kid because you'll be able to join them in your play right to be better with your coworkers because when you have a better imagination and better creativity, you're better problem solving. We all want that. You're more productive. You're more joyous. You're healthier, right? Because, you know, laughing is one of these things that releases all of these great dopamines and endomorphins and all of these wonderful things in you. People who are laughing are happy people. <laughs> so tying in and learning how to play again, just learning how to play again. A lot of people have forgotten how to do that. And it's kind of sad. I say that, you know, play is the fountain of youth. Yeah. And a lot of adults are dying of thirst. Yeah. I love this. Yeah. It's I, almost, um, it's looked at as a bad thing when you get to a certain age. I don't have time to play, but you know, grow up. <laughs> right. Why? What does that even mean? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. I hope you know, never, never, ever grow up. You can age you can grow older but you can you can you can you can stay young regardless of how old you are yes and one of the things i remember when i went to my first juggling convention when i was 15 years old and i saw people my age now right the age i'm at now and when people ask me how old i am i say i'm timeless <laughs> so people with gray hair Let's people with no hair and i saw them juggling and they're flipping clubs and doing all this and i'm going i want to have that when i'm that age and i do nice. and i can right i still have my reflexes i can still juggle five balls i can still pass clubs and when people you know i met i met some younger folks here who are who are in the circus in a circus here in vietnam and, and they asked me how old I was. I said, I'm timeless. And then after a few glasses of wine and beers, I finally revealed my age. And the guy went, 
<laughs> I want I want to have what you have when I'm here. And I'm wow. like, there. Then I'm I'm living it. I'm living the example for now the youth to go, how can I hold on to to my moxie, my magic, my enthusiasm yes. when I get to be, you know, gray haired. Wow, well, yeah. you're an inspiration. For sure. I'm inspired. Keep your mojo. For I love sure. It. Where I love can we? Where, where can we reach? Oh, where'd you go? <laughs> where, how can? How can my people... life belt. I snapped my finger. In my life belt. <laughs> um. So how oh, can yeah. we get in touch with you? Is there a website or like what? Yes, Mind of Marlin. Mindofmarlin.com. Mind of mm-hmm. uh, the the conser- uh, the Conservatory of Creativity page is about to be loaded any day now. Yes. That's a whole new thing I'm having to learn. It's amazing. Those of us who grew up in the analog world mm. have to learn how to make our way in the digital world. For sure. And so to do something like this, is like, oh my gosh, how many different software programs do I have to learn? Excel, Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, how to do <laughs> Zoom, how to, how to do wire, you know, all of these different things more and more, how to learn Canva, right? How do you, it's like, it's endless. So yeah, but you're stay- a maverick, right? Mavericks can figure that stuff and out. You're pretty darn smart. I think you've got it. <laughs> well, thank <It's> you. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. Yeah, Marlon. thank you for joining oh us. Gosh. This has been a great conversation. Thank you Love so it. much, I'm especially inspired, putting your smiling. time aside. It's working. It's working. <laughs> Whatever you're doing, you're it's giving working. Giving us mojo. Uh, giving us the moxie. I love it. Thanks. Thank you, thank so, you much. so much for having me on and letting me share share my gift. You got it, buddy. Be well. Have a great day. Thank you all for watching.